There we go. Um, so, yeah, I'll show up to lab today, but you guys can get started on working on it before lab and, and then use the time also to ask any questions about the midterm that you have. Um, specifically, so this, I always look, like to look at the average and the median. Anybody who's take, who's um, taken stats recently, can you tell me what, the, what it means when the average and the median are pretty close together? That's technically not a prereq for this class, so it's okay. I'll let you off the hook. Um, so generally speaking, that means it doesn't necessarily mean it's normally distributed, but it means that it's it's not skewed um, to the low end or the high end. It means that it's um, the scores are pretty well distributed. I have as many high scores as I have low scores. Um, it's not necessarily the same as saying it's a bell curve, but it's suggestive of a bell curve, which means that that you guys did about as well as expected on the test. Um, and across the board, you guys did a little bit worse on the mechanisms than I was hoping. Um, there are a couple exceptions there. And if you wanna know which section you had, um, what score you got on each section, I have it broken down by page, how many points you got on each page. Um, so you can go through and uh, and see where you missed your points. But for most of you, most of the points that you missed um, were were spread out pretty well, except for the mechanisms. You guys missed a lot of points on mechanisms. Um, and that tells me last year that told me when it was closed book that they just needed more practice. But I also gave them easy mechanisms. You guys, I gave uh, mechanisms that had more steps to them, more things to pay attention to. Um, and so the fact that you guys didn't do that well on the mechanism practice told me you guys were running out of time once you got there, or at least you were worried enough about time that you um, weren't able to find the mechanisms in the textbook or apply them. Um, so we will continue to work on that as the nice thing about mechanism practice, if you're taking OCHEM with an eye towards taking a standardized test, getting into PA school or med school, um, things like that, then um, you won't likely need to write out an entire mechanism at any point because that's not really something that lends itself to standardized tests. Um, so being able to at least recognize when something is wrong with the mechanism, that's a really common question to ask um, on a standardized test, be show you a mechanism and say, which step is wrong? Um, and you have to go through and identify, oh, well, that arrow has is pointing um, from a nucleus towards a negative charge and it should be the other way around. Um, so don't be too panicked about that. Um, and the other one that you guys all kind of uniformly sucked at um, was the one that I expected. Um, and that's because this is a tricky one and we haven't spent that much time with synthesis yet. Um, and I think a lot of you guys missed this section at the bottom. This says using acetylene as your only source of carbon, which means you can't just have a random carbonyl show up. You have to show me how you can make that carbonyl from acetylene before you could use this reaction that I gave you. So um, you had to start from acetylene to then try and put it together in a way that is gonna allow you to make a carbonyl. And at this point, you guys only have one reaction that makes carbonyls, right? The one reaction you have that makes carbonyls is if you have an alkene that goes through ozonolysis, right? So you had to figure out a way to put together. The other thing that tells you you might need to use some ozonolysis is if acetylene is your only source of carbon and we're trying to make a molecule that has, um, that has five carbons, it has an odd number of carbons. Well, acetylenes are all even numbers of carbons, right? So if we wanna make a target molecule that has an odd number of carbons, we have to put together the acetylenes till we've got one more or several more than we want and then use ozonolysis to chop it in half. 
And then that would give us a carbonyl that we could attack one more time with acetylene. So we would want to be making something that starts as, if we know we're using this reaction that's given at first, um, we want to start by making something where we could chop it in half to turn it into a three carbon section that has a carbonyl on it. So we could put together acetylenes until we got to, um, until we got to six carbons and then chop it in half if we got the pi bond in the right spot. And then we'd wind up with this molecule, which then we could attack with one more acetylene molecule. And that's gonna, the acetylene is going to attack here open up that carbonyl and turn it into an um, into a an alcohol. Um, and so that I was looking for something like that. Um, you so you need to would need to be you know planning planning for how can I get both of these things? Um, how can I use both of these tools? I can only use acetylene, which means I'm putting stuff together by using acetylide ions. Um, and then, and so the first step actually winds up being turning acetylene into ethyl bromide. If you partially hydrogenate acetylene to get eth ethene and then do a, a um, HBr addition, then you get ethyl bromide, which can then be attacked by a second acetylene. Um, and so as long as you were you had things arranged in a way that you were only using acetylene and you were trying to build that up into something larger, um, you got half of the points, maybe a couple more. Um, and that's about where everybody was for that one. Any, any particular questions before you look at how you did? Anybody know that you have questions on a certain test question? besides number four. Yeah, I had a question. Okay. Uh, section two, number seven. With the boro trihydride, I was expecting it to be a R2BH instead of a BH3. Section two, number seven, is that what you said, Cody? Yeah. So, and I did, and I did write it that way in terms of the um, of the mechanism. But remember, if I, if it's BH three instead of R two BH, um, that's just if it's R two BH. That, all that's going to affect is the stoichiometry, right? So if it's BH three, we have three hydrides that could be replaced with an R group, right? And so we wind up with it with only needing one BH3 for every three um, reactant molecules. And so it, it affects how much of the, of the boring you would have to add, but it doesn't affect the final product. Um, and so when I show it to you as the mechanism, that's just saying you don't have to show this happens three times for the first step because what's going to happen is you there's only one hydrogen left to be replaced. So if you had a molecule that's R two BH, you would only need, you would need a one to one stoichiometry ratio. But it doesn't affect the final product whatsoever. Does that add, answer your question on that one? Yeah. Just panic, like, ah, that's not what I was expecting. Fair enough. Um, and that's what I get for mixing and matching last year's reactants and, and uh, reactions. This was clearly attached to an alkene from last year. Um, the other one that I did notice gave a few of you on, and oddly enough, you guys actually did really well on the second page of reactions and pretty poorly on the first page of reaction. So it averaged out to be about how I expected, but you guys overall did well on the second page and not so well on the first page of reactions. Um, 
other than this tripped some people up because I switched it so you weren't cleaving this, you aren't breaking this one apart now, right? Um, it was just, we we're just going to add to each side of the pi bond, break the pi bond, but not the whole thing. And so it stayed in that bicyclic structure. Um, you just wound up with the anti-addition there. So you wound up with something that looked like that, plus the enantiomer. So if you tried to chop it in half like the practice tests because it, it was a bicyclic structure, um, you just miss the fact that the bicyclic structure looks weird, but it doesn't behave any different than any other alkane, so we, or alkene for that matter. So the only reason we would chop it up is if it went through ozonolysis. That's the only reaction we know at this point that breaks carbon-carbon-sigma bonds, right? Uh, and the other one that was a little bit harder than I intended it to be um, was this reaction with the double elimination, because you can't do a double elimination with the two bromines where they are. Because if you did, you'd wind up with five bonds to a carbon, right? If you just did the double elimination where the bromines are, you would get a triple bond that looked like that. And that gives you a carbon with five bonds. Um, so what I was counting on you guys realizing is that if you have something that can go through a double elimination, um, in terms of if you have a dihalide um, and you expose it to excess sodium amide, that actually drives the, the equilibrium to the point where you wind up shifting that pi bond, um, those two pi bonds rather, and you actually wind up with both of the pi bonds, the, only, the closest carbon that you can have both of them that's terminal. And so you wind up with making um, the alkyne that looks like That looks like that. And then that can then go through and actually you make the acetylide with the negative charge. It looks like that. And then that can add to an ethyl bromide. Um, but we didn't practice all that much with the fact that the pi bond is going to always move to the end of a carbon chain if, you, if it's exposed to excess sodium amide. Um, and so that one was one that that uh, a lot of you guys recognized it should make an alkyne, um, but didn't know necessarily where to put it. And since the the two obvious places to put it both would give you a carbon with five bonds, um, I actually I'm I'm pleased to say I think that this problem is the only one that I found a carbon with five bonds on anybody's paper. Um, and there were more than one of you who did that. So. The alkynes, you got to pay attention. You can't have two things attached to the same carbon on an alkyne, right? Because you wind up with this situation. But again, other than, oops, that's not what I meant to do. Other than those two questions, those were the two that, that um, gave a lot of people trouble. Other than that, you guys did pretty well on the reactions mechanisms we need more practice on, but we'll keep working at it. And then this one I knew was going to be tricky for you. Um, and it did, did uh, get trip you guys up. Uh, the other thing I will mention about the test um, is that only, hang on, I might sneeze. Um, only about half of you got your test submitted through Canvas the way that I prefer you guys to do it. And the other half of you had to email me your tests, um, which I did tell you was okay so that you weren't going to be panicked. Um, but I also do want to incentivize and reward those of you who did manage to get it turned into Canvas on time. Um, so everybody who actually got it submitted to Canvas on time got two extra credit points. Um, 
So that, and that's not reflected in the average, the class averages I showed you. Um, so good for you guys. Thank you for doing that. That makes my job um, a lot, a lot less stressful when I don't have to be worried about that I'm misplacing your test somewhere in my, of my, my mess of an email inbox. Um, so you just got a, a, a little thank you, not enough to really change things dramatically, but um, might, might bump you from a, you know, a 79 to an 81, um, which is always helpful. And your, so your grades show those two points. The class averages do not, but the grades show those two points already. All right, let's talk about alcohols. Every college student's favorite subject. Um, so an alcohol, we've discussed a little bit, at least in the context of an alcohol is just an OH group. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about their properties today and talk about um, some, some reactions. Um, so cyclopentanol is not that common of a molecule as far as finding it on its own. It's a common piece of biological molecules. Um, ethanol is drinking alcohol. Isopropyl alcohol or 2-propanol is rubbing alcohol. So really commonly used these days for disinfecting things. Um, there are really kind of two classes of alcohols. There are aliphatic alcohols, which are what we just call alcohols. Um, and then there's the aromatic alcohols that we refer to as phenols. A phenol, and you kind of overemphasize the O in phenol to differentiate it between when you have benzene as a branch, which would be phenol, pronounced like the herb. I guess it's not an herb, the root vegetable. Um, so phenol is when you have an, an OL indicates you have an OH group. PHEN indicates that you have a benzene ring. So benzene ring as a branch, if we we're like methyl, if we had a branch that we were, um, that was a benzene ring, we would name it as, as phenyl. See the YL to indicate it's a branch like methyl or ethyl or isopropyl. If it's a if it's a PHEN um, benzene ring with an OL at the end, that's a phenol. All right. So and those phenols react differently. They have a different set of reactions that they will go through, and so we actually break them out as a separate. Um, reactive group, a separate functional group, um, despite the fact that they look a lot like the aliphatic alcohols. Um, and we're going to tackle those sort of one at a time. The phenols are really common also as an antiseptic. Um, phenol is one of the things that they wipe down um, operating rooms with after a surgery or and before a surgery to, to prep the room to sanitize it. Um, because it's it's antimicrobial and it sticks around longer than something like isopropyl alcohol that were, you know, that evaporates very quickly. When you're talking about hand sanitizer, evaporating really quickly is advantageous. You only need it on your hands for about five seconds to kill most of the bacteria and viruses. And so you don't need something that's going to last that much. But stainless steel is not necessarily as easy to sanitize as your hands. Um, and so if you want it to remain sterilized for longer, you, they use phenol to wipe it down. And that's kind of what gives hospitals that characteristic hospital smell. One of, the, um, one of the main components of the smell of a hospital is phenol. Um, and then other substituted phenols that have other things attached to them um, are, are a, there's a wide range of biological molecules and neurotransmitters um, that are all phenols. Dopamine is a diphenol, I believe. Um, capsaicin, we know capsaicin interacts with, with your uh, taste, taste buds. Um, THC is a phenol. 
tetrahydrocannabinol. Remember, anything ends in OL, you can be pretty sure it's going to be an alcohol. It's got an OH on it somewhere. Um, the aliphatic alcohols don't show up as often except as amino acids. There are a number of amino acids that are aliphatic alcohols. Um, and they do show up as most or so all carbohydrates have alcohols attached to them. It's not, it's, they've got more aspects that turn them into a carbohydrate, but one of the primary aspects is that you have a bunch of oxygens in the form of OHs that are also attached to the molecule. Um, they have their own, their own, um, naming convention so they don't end in ol the same way but if we looked up glucose it's a ring structure that's mostly carbon with a whole bunch of ohs attached to it um, and so we see alcohols wind up being a really important functional group in organic chemistry um, because that's one of the primary ways you can make an organic molecule soluble in water is to make it more polar. And one of the easiest ways to make it more polar, or at least most common ways to make it more polar on, on Earth, is to add OHs to it. Right, so we see that a lot with, with biological molecules, um, and that's why almost Let's see, can I say it, can I phrase it that way? I'll, I'll phrase it that way. Almost all alcohols will interact with the, the enzymes in your body one way or another. Um, half of them, especially the aliphatic, simple aliphatic alcohols will just straight up kill you. Um, so not necessarily always in a good way, but if it was something that your body is not, that is not gonna interact with, then it usually won't have an effect on your body. Like your body doesn't interact with with silicon dioxide very much, which is why you can eat sand and nothing happens. If you eat sand, your body can't digest it, can't intake it, can't interact with it in any way, so it just passes through. Um, things that your body can interact with are how you get things that act as a poison. Um, also, random, um, random book recommendation. I just started a book called The Poisoner's Handbook. Um, which is about which is about the history of forensic science, basically, um, and how over at various points in human history, um, different poisons were popular to use to poison people and get away with it. Apparently, up until about the um, 1870s, most poisoners, most most people who murdered somebody by poisoning them, um, went free because they had no way of detecting. Um, a poison in a body. So as long as you did it slowly and it wasn't, the only way they had to dis, dis tell if somebody was poisoned or not was they would take their last meal and feed it to an animal. And if the animal didn't die, then they just said, well, we can't prove that it's, that this person was poisoned. Um, so up until they started introducing organic chemistry, so the first thing they figured out how to do was to test for arsenic and sort of the, the elemental poisons, the different um, elements. Um, but the, so then pretty quickly, everybody realized, well, I can't just keep poisoning people with arsenic anymore. Um, so they just moved on to organic poisons like alcohols. Um, so I, I have not finished the book yet, but it's, it's very entertaining to this point. Um, and uh, very related to organic chemistry. All right, if we're naming alcohols, naming alcohols is easy. You guys already know how to do nomenclature. Um, the, if we're naming an alcohol, it's just like naming any other organic compound. Find your longest continuous carbon chain that has the, that functional group in it, and you name it just like it's an alkane. And then at the end, you drop the E from the alkane and you add OL. So you just turn it into that, that OL suffix. Um, so here's a complicated one, 
but if you if you're looking for the longest continuous carbon chain that has the OH group, see it's nine carbons long here, so it's going to be if it we were naming it as a um, as an alkane, it would be nonane, known being the prefix for nine. If it's an alcohol, we just drop that e and add the ol in its place, so it becomes nonanol, um, which is a difficult word to say. And then we just just like with the alkenes, we have to specify where the OH group is because it can be anywhere on that chain. So we just you do it with a number. So if we have nine carbons in our longest continuous carbon chain, the third of which has the OH group, we're going to name it as three nonanol. And then we just name all the other branches. Anything we would name is with a prefix, we just name the same way as normal. So in this case, we've got two chloro groups um, and an ethyl group. So four, four dichloro, six ethyl, three nonanol. I mean, when we're picking which way to count on these, it's it's not as absolutely critical as you have to remember to put the numbers on there. Um, but you want to keep this, the number of the alcohol has to be as low as possible. There are a couple of you guys who on the, the heptine question numbered counted from the wrong direction, um, which made the numbers lower on your two methyl groups, but it made the number higher on your alkyne. Whatever we say last in the name, whatever the last thing is that we name, that's the most important functional group. So that's the one we want to make sure we keep as low as possible. And then, but all the rest of these, these steps are the same as, as everything else that we've done. So name your base molecule. Find your branches, put everything in order, um, then worry about stereochemistry if you need to. We're not going to add a new type of stereochemistry, at least for this one, right? Because there's no, there's no difference in the hybridization of the carbons here. And so it's just, if you have a stereo center, we need to name it R versus S. But we're familiar with that at this point, right? So nothing super tricky about naming alcohols. It's just a different suffix. Um, found this the other day too. I thought I'd share this with you. Um, don't ever tell an organic chemist this. They will they will shout at you. And any other chemists might not hold them back. So, but it's not technically wrong and technically correct is my favorite kind of correct. So um, we wouldn't consider it an alcohol though, because it's alcohol has to be carbon based. There has to be carbon involved for it to be an alcohol. Water is its own compound because there's no carbons involved. Um, if we want to look at some of the properties of alcohols, they behave the way many, many organic compounds behave in that they're um, not super soluble in water, except for the fact that we have um, a hydrophilic region. We have an area with a high degree of polarity. And so they, they are soluble in water up to a certain point. Um, and in general, if we look at the boiling points of, of molecules that are roughly the same size, ethane versus chloroethane versus ethanol, as you get more polar, we wind up with the boi boiling point increasing because we have increased intermolecular forces here, right? We, we go from all nonpolar bonds in ethane, which boils at negative 90 Celsius, which incidentally is about the average temperature in Minnesota right now. They're having a bit of a cold snap. It's not quite that bad, um, but it's, uh, I think they got down to negative 40. Um, so I've been, I've been enjoying the fact that we are 40 degrees above zero here in South Lake Tahoe. And my in-laws are dealing with the fact that 
you can't even park your car outside overnight um, without the windshield cracking um, if you're not careful about how you start the car up in the morning. Um, anyway, so just one more reason to live in California and not the Midwest. If you go from nonpolar to polar, if you have a dipole-dipole attraction, um, between molecules. So chloroethane has a apolar bond, but it's not that polar. Um, but our boiling point does go up significantly, go from negative 90 Celsius to 12 Celsius. If you turn that group, that polar group into an alcohol, we didn't just make the carbon bond more polar. We did, it's a little bit more polar, but the most significant thing is we added a hydrogen attached to something really polar. And adding a hydrogen means that we don't just have dipole-dipole attractions, we have hydrogen bonds that can form in the solution now, right? And remember hydrogen bonds, when, we, when you first learned about intermolecular forces, hydrogen bonds, we said, were that class of bonds where you have something, one of the four most electronegative elements covalently attached to a hydrogen. Because hydrogen does not have as many electrons, it's one, it's less electronegative than carbon. But the more significant thing is that hydrogen doesn't have a full 1s orbital underneath the bond, the valence shell. Hydrogen only has two electrons when it's got a full valence, right? And so if those two electrons are bound up in a bond that's between oxygen to hydrogen, well, if there are only two electrons around the hydrogen, that means that most of the hydrogen's electrons are actually around the oxygen and the hydrogen's sort of just stuck on there, which is what makes it so much more polar than a normal polar bond. And so, and that's one of the reasons why alcohols have very distinct properties from even from things like ketones um, or, or carbon chloride bonds is the fact that when you have an alcohol, you're adding hydrogen bonding between the molecules. And that's why you see such a dramatic jump between chloroethane and ethanol, despite the fact chlorine is almost as electronegative as oxygen. Um, and when it comes to solubility, we, we also see some similar properties. So more polar, we would expect to be more soluble in water. And that is, in fact, what we see. Ethanol is so soluble in water, um, it's what's known as miscible. Spelled M-I-S-C-I-B-L-E. And I grabbed the highlighter one on accident. But you guys can still read that. Um, miscible means that, basically means unlimited solubility. It means that there's no limit to how much, how much ethanol or methanol you could add to water. Um, you can add so much ethanol to water that it goes from being ethanol dissolved in water to water dissolved in ethanol. Which means practically speaking, there's no limit to, to what combinations you can use. Um, you're limited just by mole fraction. And when you get to the point where there are more moles of ethanol than there are moles of water, it switches to being water dissolved in ethanol instead of the other way around, but you're not really limited, like it's not, never going to be saturated. Um, which is different than some of the larger alcohols. Some of the larger alcohols, as you start, you, they still have a region that interacts well with water. But as they get longer, you get a larger hydrophobic region, a larger nonpolar region of the molecule. And at some point, that attractive force of the hydrophilic region can't overcome the, the repulsive force that keeps the hydrophobic region away from water. And so as you add more carbons onto your alcohols, you reach a point where um, they're not very soluble in water. In fact, we've you can look up numbers for each for these. And let me see if I have that on the next slide. Um, oh yeah, 
Nope, that is dealing with antimicrobial properties. Um, let me pull up a table that looks at alcohol solubility. It's a function of chain length. All right, it's a little pixelated, but we can get the, the point here. Methanol, ethanol, and propanol, they say are infinitely soluble in water, meaning that they're miscible. Um, as you start getting above three carbons, you start get, seeing the solubility drop down. So this is moles of alcohol per 100 grams of water at room temperature. Butanol, you can dissolve 0.11 moles, pentanol significantly less, and it goes down from there. Um, so we can look up these numbers, and I don't expect you to know where this cutoff is necessarily, but the rule of thumb is that we, we say that um, you need at least one OH group for every six carbons for it to be considered soluble. And even that's not going to be totally soluble. It's not going to be miscible. Um, but if you have if you have at least one OH group for every five or six carbons, then we can say uh, it'll dissolve in water. It might not dissolve well, but it'll dissolve in water well enough. We can say that a reaction can occur, for instance. Um, and so things like phenol are right at that line. And so phenol has a limited amount of solubility. Um, when when we talk about that in water, and so that's and if we go back to glucose, glucose has got six carbons, but it also has five OH groups on it. So it's got about one OH group per carbon, or close to it, which is why glucose dissolves really well in water, despite the fact it's got six carbons. It's got a lot of OHs as well. Um, and then before we get into reactions, we can talk the other major property that we use alcohols for that I already mentioned. Um, it's even more important this year than most is antimicrobial properties, including antiviral properties. Um, we find that most alcohols, especially primary alcohols and, and simple phenols, um, have antimicrobial properties and also antiviral properties. Um, they have those, they basically wind up denaturing proteins by changing the solubility. Most proteins of living cells and most proteins for viruses that are capable of infecting humans are designed so that the exterior means that they're somewhat soluble in water. They're if it's a bacteria, bacteria evolved to be in a water-based environment, and you put them into an alcohol-heavy environment instead of a water-heavy environment, and you wind up with a lot of those proteins wind up basically unfolding or folding themselves inside out. And so you wind up denaturing the, the proteins, uh, and that's why alcohols are good not just at denaturing and killing bacteria, they're also good at denaturing viral proteins um, because we're basically, we're changing the solvent. If you change the solvent, you change how the proteins on the surface of these things interact with the solvent, um, which usually means that they fall apart. Um, or at the very least, they become inert and unable to infect new cells. Um, so a lot of alcohols have some of those properties. Um, the phenols, the larger molecules, um, are not as good at, at getting rid of viruses um, because they're usually not present in high enough amounts that you wind up with them being able to actively denature the viral proteins. They will still, they will still kill bacteria and other microbes but they're not as effective at killing at uh, denaturing viruses. 
Um, and if you look at um, hop oil, um, if you look at uh, a lot of the, um, if you are into craft beer at all, you may have heard at some point the whole story about how IPAs started was why they're called India Pale Ales is because it was the, the British when they colonized India still wanted to be able to drink beer from Europe in the European style. Um, and, but they couldn't ship normal pale ale, they could, which was at the time would have been you know, bass probably. Um, they couldn't ship that overseas um, because it went bad too fast. Things would start growing in it and that it would show up to India as a sour, um, which was not like the cool trendy thing to have in your beer at that time. Um, so what they did instead is they just made it super concentrated. They made it so that, and one that saved them on shipping because they had to ship fewer barrels and plus it made it less hospitable to bacteria that would then infect the beer. Um, and so that's, and the hop oils played a big role in that. The higher alcohol content and the hop oil played a big role in that because hop oils have a lot of these phenols in them um, that make them inhospitable to, to bacteria. Um, and then what happened is the original idea is that once the, once the IPA got to India, that they would then um, dilute it with water and have normal pale ale. But then um, they, when it got there, they actually just decided that they liked drinking it better the way it was rather than, than putting, um, you know, they probably did not have access to super fresh water. And so rather than put dirty water into your beer, um, just to make it less potent, they just drank it strong. Um, and I believe actually one more, this is a more specific example. It's not microbial in general, um, but quinine is another antimicrobial um, alcohol. Let's take a gamble on whether or not it actually was an alcohol or not. Um, since it didn't end in OL. Um, but, and again, also comes from the British colonizing India and other parts of the world that had lots of mosquitoes and therefore malaria. Um, they started drinking gin and tonics because tonic had quinine in it, which was an anti-malarial. Um, and so if you drank um, lots of tonic water, then you would be less likely to get malaria if you are a British colonizer in um, tropical areas like India or Africa or South America. Um, and then being, being British, they decided that adding gin improved the flavor. Um, so they, that's where a gin and tonic was born. And the lime came from trying to stave off scurvy because lime, lots of citrus has vitamin C in it, which slows, and lots of B vitamins, which slows down scurvy as well. So the gin and tonic also is born as a result of the, um, the, age of sail, the colonization period of the British Empire. Um, let's see. Here are a couple other resource and all. I'm trying to think of what resource and all is in. I'll have to look that up while you guys are um, on your break. But these are two common um, antimicrobials that they use for, um, I believe they use both of these also in it. I think phenol, I think resorcinol is less carcinogenic than phenol. So they think they've moved towards using resorcinol in operating rooms to sanitize um, over phenol because it's, it uh, is less, less of a hazard to people that work there all the time. All right, that's a good, that's a good place to say take a break. Let's come back at uh, two after and we will keep talking about alcohol some more.
How's your weekend, Sean? Uh, it was pretty good. It was I never never long enough, but um, and a little gloomy. But other than that, it was it was good. Got a lot done. How about you? That was nice, man. Went on a bit of a, a old school horror movie kick and made me appreciate modern movies. I saw one. It's an attack of the trepids or something. It was about plants that get up and start walking around in London. It was pretty cheesy, man. Yeah, you do run into that. Although you get that in modern movies too. Um, not they're doing a better job of it these days, but uh, even as recently as the two thousands, um, you know, you had movies like The Core, where the the inside of the Earth just drops to ambient room temperature or something like that and freezes up and causes all sorts of random things to happen like the earth's magnetic field disappears and they have to drill to the center of the earth and detonate a nuke inside the earth or something like that it's, it was like armageddon except on earth <laughs> um yeah so you still had those bad ones and that was a major motion picture release that was not like a b movie although you know in retrospect history will look at it that way but it was released in movie theaters oh, so it uh you know things haven't changed that much good movies yeah. then were still are still good movies and bad movies now are still bad movies very true made a couple big lasagnas that was pretty good except i screwed them up add a little bit of those red chili flakes that you throw on pizza and made it way too spicy I, those I like adding those to my to uh, a red red pasta sauce, but you got to add them in early on so they cook down a bit. If you add them at the end, that's uh, that's gets you. Yeah, it was like a four pound batch of meat and sauce and stuff, and I threw in like one tablespoon. And it was like, whoa, that is way too spicy. Oh yeah, so I we have to be careful with ours. We get them from from um, my brother in law's father in law. Um, and, and, uh, my wife bonded over, um, growing things and woodworking and he and I bonded over woodworking. So we get, uh, our Christmas package for them every year is, um, uh, homegrown red chili flakes oh, cool. um, that he makes and dries himself or grows and dries himself. And, uh, and so I had like five flakes. It's like, like a tiny pinch <laughs> of salt is what I add to a whole batch of, of red sauce. Oh, um, man, man. So a tablespoon, I can imagine that was a little bit much. Screwed it up. All right, while everybody's getting back, I knew that there was something else that phenol was used for that I was forgetting about. Um, phenol is also a topical anesthetic um, that is really commonly used in um, throat sprays. So that, uh, I can't remember what it's called, like Cepacol, what it, that stuff is that when you have a sore throat, you spray it in your throat and it like makes you gag instantly, but then your throat feels better for 15 minutes. Um, the, what, what both makes you gag and um, numbs your throat is phenol. If you look at the active ingredient on those, it's just a topical anesthetic um, that's not nearly as effective as some topical anesthetics. So you, they can use it and spray directly onto a mucous membrane. If you use something um, like Novocaine in that, in that uh, instance would be fought way too potent and short-lived. It would not last very long. But phenol being less, um, less effective as, a, as an anesthetic um, means that it's, and it's also less soluble in water. So it sticks around longer on your throat 
and makes you feel better for a longer period of time. Um, if you, I'm actually kind of curious what it would be like now to to spray Novocaine because you get that that deadened feeling very very quickly and then not be able to swallow because you couldn't feel your throat and then it would go away in like you know three minutes or something like that. Um, Resorcinol also gets used actually especially Hexol Resorcinol um, gets used in uh, this this little blurb was interesting. They add hex hexyl resorcinol to extend the shelf life of shrimp um, by presenting the or by preventing the uh, formation of black spots on the shrimp that that they get that shrimp get when they sit in the fridge for too long. Um, they can still be okay to eat, but look really nasty. Um, and so they use sometimes they use hexyl resorcinol for that. Um, they also use, um, it is also a local anesthetic, um, and so, but you see it in throat lozenges instead of being a spray. Um, so we do, we see these, these phenols in a lot of places. Resorcinol is not, does not occur that naturally, um, but it is, it is, like I said, it's where they're, they're moving towards as far as make, um, using it to um, uh, sanitize. It's got a higher solubility in water than phenol does. So you can make a resorcinol um, solution and use it to wipe things down um, in a way that, uh, that phenol would be a lot harder. You would actually, actually use the, the free phenol or put it into a non-polar solvent like hexane before you could use it as a um use it effectively as a way of wiping things down um so methanol methanol does get used to sanitize things as well um, in general, the problem with methanol is that it evaporates too quickly. Um, so it's really, you see methanol on, um, in some cases, used to wipe things down, but because it evaporates so quickly, it's not as effective. And so that's why you typically use, plus it's um, more expensive than ethanol. Ethanol is really, really cheap, um, especially in the U.S. as a result of all of the corn production that's subsidized by the U.S. government. Um, so alcohol, drinking alcohol is actually way cheaper than methanol, despite being a larger molecule, um, because the, because ethanol is just everywhere. In fact, they have to, um, if you want to know just how cheap ethanol, straight ethanol is, um, look at the price of denatured alcohol at the hardware store. Denatured alcohol is ethanol that they add poison to so that you can't drink it. Um, and it's like $2 a gallon. Um, and so the only reason that alcohol is like, it's basically Everclear. The only reason Everclear is so much more expensive is because the government taxes it differently. Um, it's not because the cost of production is that much higher. Um, so, and that's, that's why um, most hand sanitizers use ethanol or isopropyl alcohol because they're so cheap and they're, they can be made really, really efficiently. Um, you only start when you have more specialized needs like a hospital, that's when you get into using resource and all and phenol as your, as your anesthetic, or antiseptic. <clears throat> all right. Um, as long as we're talking about those OH groups, um, we should also talk about the fact that you can deprotonate an alcohol. I um, mean, we've used the deprotonated form of the alcohol um, on a lot of our reactions, right? We use it as a strong base to uh, promote elimination reactions, um, to act as a nucleophile, um, and they're fairly stable in their deprotonated form. They're stable enough that we can isolate them as an ionic compound, which is how you get sodium ethoxide and sodium methoxide. Um, as reagents that we can use, that we can add as a solid. Um, and we can look at them, if we, if we want to know how acidic a specific proton is, um, there's, 
and this is another really common class of standardized test question for, for organic chemistry is um, on X molecule, which is the most acidic proton? Um, because that's a really easy way to write a multiple choice question, right? Is it is it proton A? Is it proton B? Is it proton C? Um, and in general, the way to evaluate that is by looking at how stable the molecule will be once you remove the proton. We don't typically look at just at the reactive group because all of the functional groups are gonna be relatively stable. They're all neutral. They all have full valences. So to evaluate how good of an acid something is, we look at how stable the conjugate base will be. And if we look at these, if we just look at uh, the first row of the periodic or the second row of the periodic table, if you take a hydrogen away from a carbon, you get something that's pretty unstable. But as you as the uh, conjugate base gets more electronegative, you wind up with it being more and more stable. Uh, right, all right, because the you wind up with the more electronegative something is, the more stable it is having a negative charge. So alcohols are more are a better acid than than um, alkanes or amines, which is why sodium amide is a very strong base. We could use that to be to promote. Um, better yields in elimination reactions, like with making formation of alkynes, is because it's a much stronger base. This is a much stronger base than just a deprotonated alcohol. And a deprotonated alcohol is a much stronger base than just an, a halide, like fluorine, like fluoride or chloride or bromide. Um, and so the more stable we can make this, the more acidic we can make things. And we can then turn around and apply that to how acidic the protonated form is. Um, in order to deprotonate an alkane, you have to get a pK, you have to get up to a pH of almost 45, um, which we can't do that in water, right? That's that's not possible um, to get to a pH that high in water. About the, the limit for in if we we're doing this in water is is around the pk of water itself which is about 15. <clears throat> excuse me um we can do this in a non-polar solvent if we pick our non-polar solvent well and we put it in with a very very strong base we can depronate this but it's really really unstable and really really nasty stuff um amines can be deprotonated around pH of uh, 35 to 40. Alcohols like water or in, in similar to water have a pKa around 15 to 18. So these are commonly used, these, these bases are commonly used in uh, aqueous solutions because um, they're not such a strong acid or strong base that they just immediately deprotonate all the water. They're about the same strength at, of a base as hydroxide. And then our most stable conjugate bases have the, um, the lowest pKa, which is what makes them strong acids. Hydrochloric acid, hydrobromic acid, iodic acid all have pKa's below zero, which means that if you put them in water, for all intents and purposes, they 100% dissociate into hydronium and the halide. <clears throat> um, what's one other thing that could that could affect these pKa numbers? What else might affect the stability of these conjugate bases? thought about it cody um i think adam beat me to it resonance oh there it is thank you yeah resonance um that's one of your go-to answers when anytime you're not sure why something happens in organic chemistry if it's not electronegativity the answer is probably resonance those are your 
anytime I ask a why question, it's probably related to one of those two things. Um, yeah, so just like with carbocations we, and free radicals, we could stabilize those unstable situations by having resonance, right? By spreading that instability around. And we can do the same thing with, with um, anions, with negative charges. Um, and we'll talk about how that works and the, the overall effects here in a second. Um, we can use sodium amide to, can be used to, um, can be used to deprotonate an alcohol, but we don't get very good yields. If we want to make a deprotonated alcohol, the easiest way to do that is to expose it to either sodium hydride um, or just sodium metal. And what happens is you end up deprotonating the alcohol and you make the, the oxide form of it. Sodium amide can be used, but we don't get very good yields with it. Despite the fact that sodium amide is a much stronger base than the alcohol, what is it about these two reactions that might give them a stronger yield, a better yield? than just a straight ahead acid base proton transfer. So I'll, I'll use the ionic salt maybe? The ionic salt. That's a good, a good thing to look at, except that sodium amide would also give us an ionic salt, right? We'd wind up making sodium ethoxide if we put this with ethanol. But the difference is, is that we're in a different class of reaction if we do that. Think back to when I first taught you guys in Gen Chem about different types of reactions. We said, well, there are, there are really redox reactions and everything else, right? And everything else included precipitation reactions, acid-base reactions, anything where the redox state wasn't changing. And those were all reversible, pretty easily reversible as far as chemical reactions go. But if you have a redox, um, the oxidation state changing, if you have a redox reaction happening, those are more irreversible, generally speaking. When you move electrons, you're going to move electrons to the more stable state, right? And moving electrons away from a stable state to a less stable state is pretty hard to do. Plus, in addition, we also have the fact that we're making hydrogen gas. And this symbol, this up arrow, um, in a chemical reaction means that you're making a hydrogen gas, which then leaves the system. The reaction's happening in the aqueous layer or in an ethanol layer. And then your hydrogen gas bubbles out of the solution. So think about it in terms of Le Chatelier. If we're removing, if it's an equilibrium reaction, but we're removing one of the products as it reacts, that's going to drive our, our equilibrium towards the product side, right? <clears throat> and so anytime we can, we get are going to get really good yields anytime we, we have a situation where one of our products can leave the system. Um, and if you ever see it written as a downward arrow, that means that you're forming a solid that's not soluble. And if you form a solid, the same thing happens, right? It falls out of the solution, which means it's not part of the equilibrium anymore. Because think about your equilibrium expressions, right? First rule of equilibrium, first and second rule of equilibrium was products over reactants. The, sec the third rule of equilibrium was solids and liquids don't count, right? solids, liquids, and gases, really, because they're not still dissolved in the same system. So we get much better yields when we have something where we can remove one of the products because that drives equilibrium further towards the product side. All right. And when we're talking about the acidity here, the the most acidic alcohols, and one of the reasons that phenols are, can, are their own class of alcohol is because they are way more acidic than aliphatic alcohols. 
Um, and again, they're such different categories that we just we refer to them as being separate functional groups. They both are OHs, but generally we will consider phenols to be a separate class than alcohol. So I'm going to stop saying aliphatic alcohols. Um, and if I just say alcohol, that means it's an aliphatic alcohol. If I say phenol, that means you've got an OH on a benzene ring. <clears throat> and here's where we see our, if, and you can look at the numbers here, um, cyclohexanol has pKa of 18. So you need, if you want it, this to be 50% of it to be in this deprotonated state, we would need the pH of the solution to be 18. Phenol, on the other hand, we can get 50% of it deprotonated by getting to a pH of 10, which that's doable in water, right? That's not that um, high of a pH as basic, but it's not nearly as basic as, uh, as an alcohol would require. So the main, the main reason, the most important reason we see this is that resonance stabilization. If you deprotonate an alcohol, you get a negative charge. And, and a charge next that's conjugated with a benzene ring has a lot of different resonance structures you can make. And each of these resonance, the more resonance structures we have, the more stable we can make this. Um, and so that winds up being the most significant one. You'll notice though that the the arrows are going the opposite direction in these resonance structures compared to if we had resonance stabilization of a carbocation or a free radical, we would have the, the arrows going the opposite direction, right? Because the arrows are always showing where the electrons move. And if you have a negative charge, you have extra electrons. You already have a full valence. So you can't have um, you're never going to draw an arrow towards the negative charge because mechanisms and resonance structures, you're showing the movement of the electrons and the extra electrons are going to move away from the negative charge. So it's all the same logic is drawing resonance structures for a carbocation, but the, the arrows are reversed. They're just pointing the opposite direction. Um, the other reason that we see that we can make phenols more acidic than alcohols, and we can even see this happening with regular alcohols, um, is if you have electron withdrawing groups nearby. So a, anything with resonance is, is considered an electron withdrawing group because you're going to pull electron density away from, from whatever it's attached to. But you can also have electron withdrawing groups that pull electron density away from the hydrogen um, just by pulling through the sigma bonds. So you don't need resonance. If you have something really electronegative that's near nearby to a, an OH group, that's going to make it more acidic. Because think, think about acidity as it's how easy it is to take that proton away, right? If it's really, if there's a lot of electron density next to that proton, it's gonna be really hard to pull it away. There's a lot of attractive forces between the positive charge of the proton and the negative charge of the electrons. So if you can pull electron density away from the, from the proton, that makes it easier to remove the proton. Effectively, it's making a magnet that's not as strong. You don't have as much attractive force between the nucleus and the electrons, but if you pull, if you have fewer electrons around. Um, uh, I'm sorry, Elke, I just saw you're in Ricola. Um, I don't think they put methanol in Ricola. Um, they might, but it'd be, they but it'd be unlikely because methanol is pretty, pretty bad for you at fairly low concentrations. So I don't know what they use. They use the resource and all. I, um, I think they use methanol. I think they might, they might use it in the production process. So there might be some, some 
residual amount, but F, but methanol is pretty nasty for you. It might be methyl something else. No, oh, you know what? It's menthol. Sorry. Menthol. Yes, there you go. Menthol. So menthol is an alcohol because it ends in OL. Mm -hmm. Um and it has some microbial antimicrobial properties and anesthetic properties, um, but not as strong as uh, resorcinol, um, which is why it's not regulated the same way and why, you know, it's in mint and, and a lot of stuff like that naturally. Um, okay, so it is, but it is an alcohol. So what, what's the deal with like the, those menthol rubs, you know, like the lotions people put on? Um, they will sometimes they will um it's it's mostly snake oil like it it, it does have a placebo effect that helps um to some extent um but it is not nearly as as effective as a um local anesthetic as as phenol is um which is also why it's not re not regulated the same way mm -hmm. you know, I don't even know if they have to li list it as a um, active ingredient in things um, because of its of where it where it sits. I'd have to look into that a little bit more as well because it does say that there's some some amounts of menthol that uh, can act as an opioid agonist, which is interesting to me because I would not have expected that. Mm -hmm. So I'll look at I'll look at menthol, menthol later. Okay. Um, back to where we were here. Um, so induction just means you have electron withdrawing groups, things that are really electronegative that are pulling on electron density. If you're pulling electron density away from an alcohol, that's going to make it easier to deprotonate. And the last thing that's going to, to affect this, and these are kind of in, in order of importance, the most important thing is, is their resonance. And if there's no resonance, the most important thing is, do you have other electron withdrawing groups around? And if you don't have that, the most important thing is how much can your solvent stabilize the deprotonated form? Right. So in particular, if we wanted to look at F oxide versus T butoxide, sterics are going to play a role here again because if it's an ethyl group that has a deprotonated alcohol the solvent that's going to stabilize that um, especially if it's a protic solvent can you can get more of the solvent molecules around it and the more solvent molecules you can get around there the more favorable interactions you can have if you have a big group that's that's sterically hindering how much your solvent molecules can get in there. There's just physically less room. Um, and if there's physically less room, it's harder to stabilize that. Um, you think about this as uh, stabilize, for some reason the, the phrase stabilizing just stuck out to me like an EMT. The more space you have to work around a patient, the more EMTs you can get around, which means maybe you know more stable, stabilized they can be versus if there is less room to work it's going to be a lot harder you can have fewer people in there helping out right so that and that winds up being the smallest difference here if you look at the pkas ethanol has a pka of 16 versus pka of 18 for t-butanol not that big of a difference not compared to um cyclohexanol versus phenol. These sterically should be very similar to each other, right? They're about they're both six carbons attached to an OH group, but the resonance um, contributes way more. So remember that pKa is a log scale, right? Because of that P. So this means that it, that phenol is 10 to the eighth times more acidic than cyclohexanol. So 10 to the eight. So 10 to the six is a million. So 100 million times easier to deprotonate um, phenol versus here we have pK of 16 versus 12. So that's a difference of 10 to the four, right? So it's 10,000 times easier to deprotonate. 
versus the sterics, only a factor of 10 to the two difference. So by far, the most important is, is there resonance? And then induction, and then last, lastly, this is really down to the splitting hairs. If you don't have anything else, we wouldn't even, for all intents and purposes, if, if, if you don't have a table of pKa values in, sitting in front of you, we would consider these to be about the same acidity. Their, their pKa's are so close together that we would just con we would consider those relatively the same level of acidity. All right, so if, if I asked you a question like order these from most acidic to least acidic, the sterics should be the last thing that you consider. All right, so let's practice some deprotonation. Let's do some practice steps here. Um, and then on the question below is which of these is more acidic and why? So draw the deprotonated form for 12.4 and then fix, figure out which one's more acidic for each of these pairs for 12.5. All right, I'm going to mute and give you guys a few minutes to try that, and then we'll work through that. Hey, Sean, I had a question about, I guess, sterics. Yeah. So I'm looking at 12.5a uh, and it's saying like, which I'm just looking at the two. That's such a long chain. And if every single one is tetrahedral, then can't technically like that chain, that very end of it kind of like wrap itself even more closely around the OH as opposed to the, I guess the, I don't know, what is that? Triethyl, I don't know what to call that. Yeah, we would name that as uh, like di diethylpropanol. We'd probably name it as a pentanol, pentanol, ethyl pentanol. Oh, there, yeah, yeah, five. Um, but the the biggest difference is going to be the fact that if you have that long chain, yes, it can turn wrap around and get in the way, but for the most part, it's going to it's going to be pushed out of the way by the attractive forces of the solvent around. And so because it's not directly attached, it's for the most part just going to be out of the way because it's less attracted. Um, and so it's it's still going to have some steric effect. Um, I would we would expect this, we're comparing this to say methanol. Um, we would expect the long chain one to be slightly less acidic than methanol. But compared to something like like the three ethyl groups here, all three of those are, they have to be right next to the OH, right? And, right, and so right. They, there's no opportunity, there's no freedom for them to get out of the way to make room for, for favorable effects. Does that make sense? Yeah, kind of statistics wise, I guess. Yeah, and just, just the amount of freedom that you have. Um, if you think about, um, I don't know, maybe a, a keychain. If you've got a keychain where you've got a whole bunch of stuff directly on your keychain that's all right next to the key you're trying to use, it's going to be a lot harder than if you have a keychain on one of those, um, you know, on one of those uh, lines where it's just one key on there. You can move the rest of your keys out of the way a lot easier. Yeah, yeah, I see that. Thanks.
All right. Well, and before we go through these, I just thought it was worth noting as well. The very first sentence, if you look up menthol in Wikipedia, is not to be confused with methanol. Um, appropriate. Um, so I did look, read this a little bit. And so this is getting into the, um, it is a local anesthetic. It's pretty mild that way, although it can be at large enough doses. Um, it's what's known as a kappa opioid receptor agonist. And so kappa opioid receptors um, are a class of receptor molecules that actually have a pretty wide range of effects. Um, and it, you know, the classic opioids like morphine and, and um, codeine and things like that, they wind up affecting a lot of these opioid receptors. And that's what gets you the, the um, not global, what's the opposite of a local anesthetic? Um, systemic? General. Anesthetic? General, thank you. You get your general anesthetic properties from opioids because they affect these opioid receptors everywhere. Um, and they affect a wide range of them. There's about five different kinds of opioid receptors. Um, that all have different effects. The kappa opioid receptors, I actually was really interested to see this. Um, they affect your pain the way most opioid receptors, the way we would normally um, you know, prescribe opioids would be to lower pain. Um, kappa opioid receptors also affect consciousness and can produce some dissociative effects as well. So salvia um, is actually is an, a dissociative hallucinogen that affects the same... Um, the same receptor site that menthol does, um, which is which is interesting. And the other thing is that if you look at the other effects here, um, it's also linked to addiction, mood, and stress. And agonists like menthol actually produce a dysphoric, which is the opposite of a euphoria, is a dysphoria, um, a dysphoric effect. So smoking menthol cigarettes is not particularly good for you for a variety of reasons, but it's also going to be more addictive than normal because menthol can act as, as a um, agonist for these KOR receptors. Um, and also in the realm of possible drug interactions that you don't want to mess with, um, salvia is not a great recreational drug, although it gets sold that way because it's not super well regulated. Um, and you might not ever think, hey, you know, smoking menthols while I have some salvia is, is those are totally unrelated drugs, but turns out not so much. Um, and that could produce some really weird effects. So not that I would ever, ever recommend doing salvia to anyone. Um, but definitely not if you're also going to smoke menthol cigarettes, because I just don't, don't even want to think about what sort of side effects that might have. Your salvia trip might go from five minutes long to 15 minutes long, which is about 15 times too long. And so what about the the rubs? Is that just, I don't know. You might get some normal? of it. It's, it's a weak enough anest local anesthetic that unless you put it on like a cut, if you, or like a, if you put it on a rash or you put it directly on a mucous membrane, you might get enough of it absorbed. So there might be a little bit and it will feel good like, like Ben Gay or Icy Hot or um, what's the Tiger Balm is the one we always used um, when I was uh, in athletics a lot that was really good for joint pain. Um, it might get some effect from the menthol, but most of it's going to be coming from that other active ingredient, which is going to be something that, that uh, gives you that more burning sensation. Hmm. Oh, and sorry, uh, on, on that, have, what about like CBD rubs? I mean, is that, is that just kind of the same idea where it's just kind of. CBD is interesting because it does affect, so it affects a different range of receptor sites. I don't think it affects opioid sites, so it's going to treat pain differently. Um, and as I understand it, the, the way that it was explained to me at one point was that um, CBD and marijuana in general affect pain relief, not by, by slowing down the nerve cells that are sending the pain. They basically convince your brain it doesn't mind the pain. 
which is it's sort of a different mechanism of action. They act on a different class of receptor sites. Oh. Um, so I would expect that to also be the case with CBDs, although there's not a ton of research on that area yet. Mm -hmm. um, so, we'll, but I do expect that that's one of those areas that we will see a lot of research in, in coming years because there are some, CBD oil is good for things in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. um, although not for everything that you get told that it's good for, right? It's right now, it's the buzzword. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's uh, they call that a panacea. A panacea yeah, means that it gets prescribed as the cure for everything. Mm -hmm. um, and there are good uses for it, but it's probably not all the ones that you see it recommended for. So, um, yeah, it's been kind of placebo for in my experience, but maybe I'm just not using it for the right things. So, one of the re one of the ways it's it doesn't wind up a placebo is that it winds up that CBD does not make you high on its own, but it it actually it uh, dramatically amplifies THC. So if you have CBD and a little bit of THC, you get a very, very strong body high that, that mellows out all of your pain. Um, and it doesn't take very much THC to do that if you have a lot of CBD present. So that's why you see a lot of CBD extracts have a little bit of THC in them, especially if you're supposed to take it orally. Mm -hmm. um, and that will give you the less of the head high, which is the THC's effect. Um, yeah. You, and, and so, yeah, when you wind up with sort of modulating those two things, recreationally, you might be taking the one that's a lot more of the headspace and less of the body high. But if you want for pain relief, you take more CBD and less THC. Um, but again, that's all still being very, you know, studied. And so that's a lot of that is anecdotal evidence at this point. Um, Good to know, though. Yeah, there, it's, it's definitely a, it's a brave new world. <laughs> um, I one a guy that I went to high school with who went to Cal Poly to be an engineer to be a I think he got his degree in agricultural engineering. Um, he actually has his own CBD extraction business where he buys up um, where he buys up waste from dispensaries in Hawaii and uh, and does CBD extraction and then sells it back to them as CBD extract. Um, so. He was, uh, I was actually just talking to him last week about random stuff. And um, we talked about that a little bit. So very interesting area. All right, let's go through these before we run out of time here. Um, let's, so if we wanted to look at the deprotonated form of these, the deprotonated form of the alcohol, for all of these, the alcohol is going to be the easiest thing to, to deprotonate, right? So it's the most acidic functional group on here. And so for, for A, 12.4A, we just wind up with the oxygen with a negative charge, right? And that's going to be the same for all of these, the deprotonated form. It's just going to be oxygen with a negative charge. All right, so drawing the alk oxide ion, that's really easy. It's, this, it's the conjugate base of the acid is just going to be the, the deprotonated alcohol. Um, so for 12.5, well, we already talked a little bit about A. We'll come back to it in a second because that's our least important. If I was answering this question on a test in a test situation, I would answer the really obvious ones first, where you've got resonance versus no resonance. Boom, that's really easy. Resonance means more acidic because the charged state is going to be more stabilized if you have resonance. Um, C, they both have resonance. So we're going to have to look and say, well, is that going to give us additional, an additional resonance structure? Um, if we if we have that, and so we'll look at drawing those in a second. Let's look at B first. We have phenol versus pentachlorophenol. The pentachlorophenol, you've got a bunch of extra electron withdrawing groups attached. If you have extra electron withdrawing groups, 
um, that means that it's going to be easier to remove that hydrogen because the electron withdrawing groups that are pulling the electron density towards the ring structure means you're pulling electron density away from that oxygen and therefore also away from the the hydrogen which means it's not as attracted to the oxygen so that one would be more acidic um a we talked about more sterics that are directly attached or that are close to the alcohol group means um, that there's less stabilization that can happen. And so we would expect the primary alcohol to be more, uh, more acidic than the tertiary alcohol. And then last but not least, by which I mean, and most complicated is this last one. These in the context of identify which one is more acidic, it's, this is not that tricky. We have extra resonance that can happen. Likely if we have, if we look at the ketone that's attached, um, if it was the context of, if the question was phrased as, um, is one of these likely to be noticeably more acidic or measurably more acidic? Uh, these two are a little tricky. We might not be able to directly tell is one of them going to be more acidic than the other because in order for it to be more acidic, we have to be able to resonate that negative charge all the way out to that other part of the molecule. And what I mean by that is um, when we go, let me clear this real quick. If we look at the resonance structures that we get from, from having a negative charge here, if you have a negative charge in the benzylic position, you, you can resonate that negative charge to three of the six carbons. You can only put that negative charge in three specific places as these resonance structures. These, this position here and here, those carbons don't have a negative charge on them in any of these resonance structures, right? And so putting something in, this is what's called the meta position. The meta position is never gonna have a negative charge due to resonance here. And so we just abbreviate that with M. The negative charge only goes to the pair, uh, I'm gonna mix this up, ortho, is directly adjacent and para is the opposite side of the of the benzene ring. And so putting if we look at this question this ketone is attached to the para position. If it was attached to the meta position we wouldn't be able to resonate the charge very well. But because it's in the para position we can now, for the way this question's worded, we can just look at it and say, well, that's an additional pi cloud there. That's an electron withdrawing group because it's going to have some amount of resonance. Therefore, if I'm just comparing it to straight a straight benzene ring, we can definitely just circle that one. But it gets, I just wanted you guys to be paying attention to the resonance structures. Just because there's resonance does not mean that all of the carbons involved in the resonance are equally likely to go through some of these reactions we're gonna add here in a little bit. Um, and so if we wanted to draw the resonance structure here, the resonance structure that puts a negative charge on the para position would look like So we have depronated oxygen. It would look like that would be the resonance structure. And if we have this ketone attached there, that gives us one more spot to resonate the negative charge. And so we'd wind up with another resonance structure. And I see your hand, Adam. I'll, get, I'll answer your question in just a second. 
wind up with, let me erase this one down here so it's out of the way. We wind up with a resonance structure that looks like that. So because it's in the para position, we do have resonance that can get that negative charge all the way out there. And that gives us an additional resonance structure. Additional resonance structure means it's more acidic. Adam. Yeah, I was curious if, um, even if it was on the uh, meta position, would the oxygen still count as a, um, I guess, an electron dense uh, atom? Like, is it, is it still pulling towards that direction, which is opposite of the hydrogen? Like, wouldn't that still kind of affect it? Like, couldn't you just see that the oxygen atom addition is going to clearly make it more acidic, whether or not it's meta or para? So it turns out no, because so yes, the oxygen is still in it. Um, through induction, the oxygen is still going to pull electron density a little bit, but it's actually going to donate electron density via resonance because this is this pi bond could then actually, if we had a positive charge instead of a negative charge, having something in the meta position allows it to give electron density into the benzene ring as opposed to pulling electron density. If it's in the ortho or the para position, we can pull electron density out. And we will spend a lot more time with that when we get to aromatic compounds. Um, I just, one, I wanted to, to define ortho, meta, and para, and we'll go over that again as well. Um, and you, know, you can't just look at it as there's a pi bond there, therefore by resonance, it's going to be electron withdrawing. It's a little bit more complicated than that in the nature of all things re resonance. It's a lot more complicated than that. Complicated, you say, huh? <laughs> exactly. Um, but, so we'll end there for now. And like I said, we will continue to expand on that um, in the future. Um, I will post the key to the exam as soon as we're done here. Um, if you have questions you want to ask in private you can, about your test, you can come to office hours at 1030. If it's generic, um, I don't understand this part of this question and you don't mind asking um, in front of the group, I'd encourage you to ask during loud today because we'll have the time and that way everybody can hear the explanation. Um, but if you really don't feel comfortable doing that, then feel free to come to office hours at 1030. All right. We'll end it there and uh, I will see you guys at one. <laughs>